Hello, Algebra 1. Today we are talking about piecewise fun functions. Piecewise. It's not like piece. It's like puzzle pieces. Isn't that a beautiful puzzle? If they're only, I don't know, a sunshine in it with a bluebird. That's all I got. <laughs> but we are going to talk about pieces of a function and how they act together. Let's um, review a little bit um, absolute value and um, figure out what absolute value. So for each real number a, the definition, the absolute value of a is the distance between 0 and a on a number line and is denoted bar space, bar a bar. Um, so starting with um, the first example, solve each one variable equation. If I look at um, absolute value of x equals 6, so the distance between 0 and x, 0 and x on the number line is 6. So my distance is 6. That means x can be equal to negative 6 or 6. I would write that in set notation, negative 6 and 6. Um, I can also look at that as when I have absolute value of x equals 6, x can equal um, plus or minus 6, and then I would solve it. So if I look at this next one, if I take down those absolute value bars, I can say that x minus 5 equals 4, or x minus 5 equals negative 4, and then I have to solve each of those separately. x equals 9, x equals 1. So my, ooh, that's awful, my set notation would be 1 comma 9. Make sense? For this next one, I need to isolate those absolute value bars first. And I've got x plus 3, absolute value of x plus 3 would equal negative 5. Now I can go ahead and write two equations because the distance can be, um, <clears throat> the distance is 5, so my answer can be negative 5 or positive 5. Solve this, I get negative 8 solve this one, and I would get 2. So set notation, I'll write the smallest one first, negative 8 to 2. And there are my, oops, three answers. That's not included. All right. Um, next example. Determine at least five solutions for each Two variable equation. Make sure some of the solutions include negative values for either x or y. So I'm going to plug in values for x and get my solution. I'm going to put them in set notation once I turn on my pen. So these are going to be ordered pairs. I'm going to do negative 2, negative 1, 0, because that's super simple, 1, I don't know why I wrote that. 1 and 2. If I plug negative 2 into x, um, the absolute value of negative 2 is the distance, which is a positive 2. The absolute value of negative 1 is 1. Absolute value of 0 is 0, 1, and 2. So there are at least five solutions. Same thing. Oh, I forgot to close my set notation. Um, let's use the same values here. Negative 1, sorry, I mean negative 2. Negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now I'm going to plug negative 2 into my equation. x minus negative 2 is x plus 2. Oh my goodness, rewind, press play. I'm going to plug in negative 2 for x. So negative 2 minus 5 is negative 7. Negative 1, oh, but it's absolute value of negative 7. I'm 
going to have negative 2, absolute value of negative 2 minus 5 is the absolute value of negative 7. The distance is always positive. Sorry about that. Um, negative 1 minus 5 is negative 6. Absolute value of negative 6 is 6. 0 minus 5 is negative 5. Absolute value of negative 5 is 5. 1 minus 5 is negative 4. Absolute value is 4. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. Absolute value is 3. And there are my answers. Um, next one. So if I plug in... Um, determine at least five solutions. So one, two, three, four, five. Here I'm actually going to plug in y values. Because it just makes better sense when I have the absolute value of y. So the absolute value of negative 2 is 2. Negative 1 is 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now, amazingly enough, we are going to spend some time today graphing these. All right, like I said, the next thing that we're going to do is graph what we did. So I cut and pasted our order pairs from the last slide. Um, these graphs are a little tiny, but I will fit them on here anyway, right? So let's go ahead and graph um, negative 2, 2. I'm going to do my best, right? Negative 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Oh, that was a bad one. Um, those aren't the best, but you can see the pattern I'm trying to go for. Absolute value has a slope of 1 and negative 1. So it looks like that and that, if you can sort of see that. Um, this next one shifts. Um, I like to just start noticing the patterns, patterns now. When I have x minus 5, I'm actually going to shift 5 to the right, not the left, the right. There you go. All right, let's graph this one. So over 2, down 2. Um, over 1, down 1, 0. There we go. Whenever it's x equals a y, um, we've always got a rotation. It opens left and right. There we go. Moving on. So write a brief summary. Um, comparing and contrasting the three solution sets and their graphs. I've got a and b, which are pretty simple. Um, they're the same, except like I told you, B, um, the vertex, the V has shifted right five spaces. Okay, so that's where the vertex is. I guess we could say the bottom part of the V um, shifted five spaces to the right. With C, we actually have a, um, it's like a 90 degree clockwise rotation. And we could say very fancily about the origin. So moving on, um, for parts e through j, let's consider the function f of x equals absolute value of x, where x can be any real number. Notice it's a function. When we're graphing it, we say y equals the absolute value of x. But when we are talking the function, we just say f of x equals the absolute value of x. Um, so first of all, let's explain the meaning of the function f in your own words. So that, that function just assigns every value, every real number, sorry, every real number to its absolute value. And that absolute value is the distance, which is the distance, the 
point, the point in question, the x, is from 0 on the real number line. Nothing too fancy. Um, so each number and its opposite will have the same range element. So each number and its opposite, the opposite sign, will have the same range element. And then 0 is assigned to 0. Um, state the domain and range of this function. So the domain is all real numbers. Fancy way to write all real numbers, right? Do you remember? And then the range is all non-negative real numbers. Here we're going to create a graph of the function. We've already done this. Um, we already listed ordered pairs. We did that in the opening exercise. I think it was graph A. So I'm just going to recreate it. And this is actually called our parent function for f of x equals x, the graph being y equals absolute value x. It's the, the parent, the most basic, the most, I don't know, plain Jane, right? So how does the graph of absolute value function compare to the graph of y equals absolute value x? Um, look the same to me. They are identical. So they're identical because each ordered pair in the function would make the equation y equals absolute value x a true number sentence. Um, so if the domain that we talked about, the all real numbers, goes into x, um, then the range, sorry, the domain, then the range is substituted for y. So that's how our graphs are identical. To find the function whose graph would be identical to the graph of y equals absolute value x went minus 5, well, the function is f evaluated at x equals x minus 5. So this is the graph. Whenever you see y equals, we know that's the graph. And this is the function. Could you define a function whose graph would be identical to the graph of x equals absolute value y? Well, if you remember, this one looked like this. And that means for every value of x, so say x equals this dot, we have two values of y. So when we talk about function and whether it's a function or not, we have one going to many, and we know that is not a function. Great. So let f of 1 of x equals negative x for x less than 0, and f of 2 of x equals x for x is greater than 0. So we've got this function and that function. Graph the functions f1 and f2 on the same Cartesian plane. How does the graph of these two functions? So let's do this one in blue and this one in yellow. So for x is less than 0, we're going to have, or in blue, for x is negative 1, we have positive 1. For x is, wait a minute, went backwards. When x is negative 1, we have y is positive 1, x negative 2, y positive 2. So there, but not 
it doesn't equal zero. So I will back that into zero in a second. For the yellow, when x equals one, f of x equals one, etc. So that's gonna go this way. It just means that my blue goes right up to zero but doesn't quite include it. Yes. Same as f of x equals the absolute value of x. So we're saying if I separate that into pieces, I can say f1 of x equals negative x when x is less than zero, and f2 of x equals x when x is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, I split it into pieces for the piecewise. So the absolute value function of f is defined by setting the function at um, equals absolute value x for all e real numbers. The other way to write it is by piecewise um, into two pieces, which mean the same thing as the one. All righty, so let's try another one. Let g of x equal absolute value x minus 5. So the graph of g is the same as the graph of the equation y equals absolute value x minus 5 if that we drew earlier. Using the redrawn graph below, rewrite the function as a piecewise. This is why we practiced um, linear equations for a day through our delta math. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the left which is right here. And it looks like I'm going through a y-intercept of 5 and a slope of up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. So my rise over my run. So my equation is going to be negative x plus 5, right? Very cool. If I extend this down, because I want to see where it crosses the y-axis, I'm going to work on the right side of the graph. So my y-intercept is negative 5, and my slope is positive 1, positive 1. So g of 2 equals negative 5x. Um, no. Sorry about that. Mm, just plain old x. So 1x minus 5. You don't have to write that 1. Um, I just wanted it there for a placeholder for you guys. All right, so let's do see what they said. Label the graph of the linear function with a negative slope by g of 1. Ch -ch -ch -ch. And the graph of the linear function with a positive slope is g of 2. Oh, I should shade that. Sorry. There we go. g of 1. I've got the slope is negative 1. The y-intercept is 5. So we have our equation. g of 2. The slope is 1. The y-intercept is negative 5. So we have our function. Writing g as a piecewise function is just a matter of collecting all the different pieces and the intervals upon which they are defined. So right here. Um, the left is when x is less than 5. That's the x is less than 5. The right is when x is greater than 5. So less than 5 and greater than 5. And that right there is our piecewise function. All right, let's do some exploring. All right, here's where things get different. You have probably not seen this information before and you're going to need it for the homework tonight. So if you're getting tired, go ahead and take a break and come back, okay? It's a very good idea to take a break sometimes and come back. Um, I've got 13, 14, five more slides. Um, 
and it's, it's just new information. So I already took a break. I stretched, got a drink of water, and now I'm ready to go again. So the floor of a real number X denoted by this part right here where you see um, those brackets. They sort of have a floor on them. It's the largest integer not greater than X. Okay, weird, I know. The ceiling of a real number X denoted by that with the ceiling on it we've sort of got x with the ceiling is the smallest integer not great or not less than x Whew. we're going to practice don't worry the sawtooth number of a positive number is the fractional part of the number that is to, to the right of its floor on the number line i have no idea what it's talking about just kidding i really do but it's it's different and new in general for a real number x, the sawtooth number of x is the value of the expression x minus the floor x. Each of these expressions can be thought of as functions with the domain being the set of real numbers. Okay, I know it's different, but we're going to work on a table to um, fill things out and show you what it means. So we're going to fill out a table first to practice, and then we're going to graph the table. Okay, it's going to be all right. All right, here we go. So I've got all these numbers here. And first we're gonna do the floor. I'm gonna re read to you what the floor means. The floor of a real number is the largest integer not greater than x. Oops. Largest integer not greater than x. And x is a real number. So the largest integer not greater than x. So for example, 4.8. The largest integer not bigger than this is 4. Negative 1.3. You need a number line. Um, 0, 1, 2. So 1.3 is right about there. The largest integer not greater than x because 1 is going to be greater than x, so I need negative 2. That one's confusing. Let's draw that so it's a little clearer. I'm going to do it sideways. So I've got 0, one, negative 1, negative 2. So if 1.3 is about there, the largest integer not greater than x. So I need an integer smaller than x. So that's the negative 2 is smaller than negative 1.3. I know, it makes total sense, right? 2.2, um, the largest integer not greater than is 2. 6, same thing. Negative 3, here's where it's the number line. It's a little bit crazy. I need, well, actually, that one's easy because it's the same thing. It is an, in it is an integer. Negative two-thirds is negative um, 0.667 repeating. So the largest integer not greater is going to be negative 1. It's that negative number line. You might have to draw it. And pi would be 3. All right, let's try the ceiling. Definition of the ceiling. I'm looking back. The ceiling of a real number x is the smallest integer. integer not less than x. I'm telling you, I see one of these on the ACT or SCT all the time too. It's so obscure. All right, so smallest integer not less than x. We need something bigger than x. That's why we're at 5. And for the negative 1.3, if I go to this number line, that's where it's graphed. So bigger is going to be negative 1 very backwards. 2.2 would be 3. 6 is still 6. Negative 3 is still negative 3. Um, 2 thirds, I need to go the other way on the number line. And pi is going to be 4. Now we're going to do the sawtooth, which is x minus the floor. 
so negative 1.3, so I'm using all of these values, right? Negative 1.3 minus negative 2 is neg or 0 0.7. 2.2 2 minus 2, 0.2. 6 minus 6, negative 3 minus 3. Um, negative two-thirds minus one is going to be one-third. And pi minus three is just pi minus three. I can't round pi, so I can't really calculate it. Right? All right, so we need this chart to graph on the next slide. So get, keep your chart, fill it out. I'm going to refer back to mine without the slide. So we're going to graph them. These are a little difficult. Um, the floor. So the floor equals, um, hmm, hold on a second, let's see if I can do this. Okay, we're going to, I just need bigger, so there's the floor of x. Um, if you remember, the definition says that the floor is going to be the largest integer not greater than x. So when I graph it... Um, if I look at the pieces and parts, like zero is going to include everything except, ooh, that's not going to work. I might have to use my pen. There we go. So I've got a closed dot on zero, and it includes everything on the number line except the number one. Maybe I'll do this. Close dot, everything right up to open dot on the number one. So if I go up one, I'm including the number one, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.8, all the way up to 1.9, but not in two, not including the two. So I'm including everything on the number line except the integer. Okay. This is the ceiling. That's a closed dot, open dot. I'm exaggerating my dots because it's sort of hard to see. Okay, that's our graph of our floor. And this one didn't record either. Um, the sawtooth one in the next slide didn't record. Now I'm going backwards and checking. Um, so yes, I sketched the saw or the ceiling quickly, but if you look at the table, it includes my intervals, you know, it can't include that number, but it includes this one, which is the opposite of the floor. Um, so that should make sense looking at your table. No, nope, just the end. Um, sorry, this didn't record, um, but here you go. That's the sawtooth. If you look at your table, it's going to have all that information on there, and I just sketched it really quickly because my video wasn't recording. Sorry about that. Um, but we can answer questions in class. Oh no. And the last piece that didn't record. So um, each one I've got the first one, the second one, all of this. And then the third one, sort of messy, sorry. And finally the fourth one. Cool. And then, like I said, these are all the definitions, the relevant vocabulary that I need you to know. I like how they've put these last, these things in here again so you can review them again. That's all I got. Good work.